Good day. Um, so good to be here with you. Another week has passed, and here we are uh, on uh, uh, Victoria Day weekend here in Canada. And so grateful for you to have me in your places. And um, my prayer for you and my hope for you is that your week has been blessed. And even in maybe some of your struggles and situations that are in front of you, that you would put your full trust in the Lord. So I want to begin by asking you this question. How would you define wisdom? How would you define wisdom? Well, if we go to dictionary.com, we see that uh, wisdom can be defined in a few different ways. Wisdom, wisdom can be defined as uh, wise sayings or teachings or a wise act. It is also defined as academic knowledge or, or learning. Wisdom can be defined as the quality or state of being wise. That is the knowledge of truth um, coupled with just judgment as to the action to do or to go forward with. You may have heard wisdom described in terms like clear thinking or sound judgment or good judgment and even common sense. So the question is, where does one find, or better yet, get uh, wisdom? When you consider the Bible and the God's Word, it encourages you and me to seek after wisdom, to pursue wisdom. We see in Proverbs 16, 16, the, the, uh, the, uh, the proverb saying, how much better to get wisdom than gold. You see, the Bible teaches that wisdom is more valuable than even riches or gold. The book of Proverbs itself is defined uh, as wisdom literature. And when we look at the Bible, through the Bible, we see it also teaches there are different kinds of wisdom. For example, there is godly wisdom and there is worldly wisdom. So when it comes to wisdom, the follower of Jesus Christ needs to ask themselves, a question. In the light of all that God has done for you and for me, through His Son, Jesus Christ, how do we live life wisely? And this is the question that um, writer John Bloom asked in his article, Don't live strong, live wise. Now, he's uh, honing in on a specific area of, of the world's wisdom or the worldly wisdom that we're going to be looking at here in a second. But he goes on to propose in his article that, we, that people suffer from what he calls time confusion. And, and, he, and he describes it this way, quote, We know our lives are short, and yet we all find this hard to actually believe. So the question is why? Well, when you look at it from the biblical perspective, we see that all people, you and me, were created in the image and likeness of God. And God himself put eternity into our hearts. There's a good example of that in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Yet we are born into sin. That's what the Bible teaches. And God has placed all under the judgment of physical death. And spiritual death. That's how we get this term from dust to dust. And this teaching uh, we see begins in Genesis chapter 3. And Bloom would go on to say that this creates within us uh, what he calls spiritual dissonance. Spiritual dissonance, that is spiritual conflict. But Bloom goes on and he suggests there's another issue at hand. People suffer from significance confusion. Significance confusion. Because we are created in the image and likeness of God, we naturally know that our lives are significant. And again, the question needs to be asked, who gave us our significance? So biblically, it, uh, the Bible teaches us God, and we want to go to Psalm 139, 13 and 14 for some evidence of that. However, because of sin and our sinful pride, uh, we want to measure ourselves in a different way. We want to measure uh, what Bloom would say, our significance, not by God's estimation of ourselves, but by others, other people's admira admiration. 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 Boy, guys, I'm having a hard time with that word, and it's late in the day, so my apologies. In other words, we want to be praised by others, to put it simply. And Bloom would say, quote, we are significant creatures, but we want to be significant gods. 
You know, when you consider our current cultural setting, while there are true and good things to find, uh, to be found, the fundamental wisdom of the culture celebrates and promotes self-sufficiency and self-determination. Friends, fallen humanity strike, strives in seeking wisdom in self and celebrates of those who in appearance have become wise and successful. And this is often, often measured with, uh, with metrics such as wealth or talent or influence or physical strength or beauty and power. And Bloom then sort of focuses in on the mantra that he, that he sees in the culture. And the mantra is live long and live strong. And, and Bloom calls this out rightly as a delusion and points to the Bible, specifically Psalm 90, where uh, the psalmist said, you return man to dust. Speaking of God, the years of life are 70 or, or even by reason of strength, 80. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom, Psalm 90. So we're right back to that question. In the light of all that God has done for you and for me through his son, Jesus Christ, how do we live life wisely? Please turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 as we continue in our sermon series, Ephesians Blueprint, and pick up, pick up where we left off last week at verse 15 through to the end of the chapter. Ephesians 1, 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his might, verse 20 now, that he has worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Verse 22, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all the things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we just thank you as we come into this, this text. We are mindful of, of the need that we have to, to understand your word. To understand your word, not only for ourselves individually, but as a body of Christ, as a church, wherever we are located in a local church in this world. For your letter here to the Ephesians, O Lord, is where we will find out, find out the answer to that question. Where is our pur what is our purpose and our place in the church? And what is our purpose and place in the culture? And help us, O Lord, by your spirit to understand and to walk this out in our lives. And for all these things, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we discovered uh, from chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, the tone of the letter that we have in our hands today. And what might be the tone? Well, verse 6 uh, helpful is very helpful to us. There Paul said, To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. And it's Paul's praise for all that God had done for the Ephesian believers in Christ, which sets the tone for all that will follow through every sentence and paragraph, and even here in the text that we are looking at today. And it's Paul's heart of praise for the faithful saints in Christ residing in Ephesus that brings him to an attitude of thankfulness and prayer. And we see this here in verse 15 and 16. Please read this with me. Paul here said, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. You know, if you spend any time with Paul in the New Testament, you will quickly discover that Paul understood the importance of prayer in a believer's life and just as important for the corporate life as the church as well. 
we discover that Paul prayed and prayed. A couple examples for you. In his letter to Philemon, in verse 4, Paul said, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. And often, uh, Paul, in his letters, uh, you can just check those out for yourself, he would be you know, dictating uh, his letter to the Ephesians or the Galatians or whatever church or, or people that he was dictating to uh, through the work of a secretary. And often as he was saying the things that he said in his letter, he would come to a place where he would just pray. And those are recorded for us. One example for you is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, where Paul prays, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So, friends, Paul prayed. He prayed. And, of course, a question to ask ourselves is, do you pray, or do we pray, or do I pray? You see, the biblical principle work here in Paul throughout his ministry, and certainly as we see it here in this letter, is this. Praise and prayer are like two peas in a pod. Praise and prayer are like two peas in a pod, folks. Praise of God will lead to prayer to God. Prayer to God will lead to praise of God. So again, do you pray? Here's the point. Verse 15 to 23 is Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus, for the believers there. And we can appropriate that for ourselves as well, for this is the inerrant and authoritative word of God. So we ask, what did Paul petition to God for the church at Ephesus? And before we answer that question, we also should notice who Paul prayed to. Now you're probably going, of course we know who we pray to. Well, let's, let's look at that in verse 17, first half there. Paul prayed to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. I'll say it again. He prayed to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. So who does Paul pray to? Well, friends, he pray, prays to the first person of the Trinity, God, the Father of glory. So this gives us something to consider. Christian prayers, prayer, my friend, my friends, my brothers and sisters, according to New Testament, is Trinitarian in nature. And this is important for us to understand, as it was for the Ephesian church itself so long ago. Remember, when we began our study about three weeks ago, we learned that Ephesus was the home of the goddess Artemis. And there was a temple there built for her, or the goddess Artemis, Diana in the Roman pantheon, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Artemis, along with the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods, and the many occultic practices in Ephesus, presented the church at Ephesus with many challenges in their uh, worship of the one triune God. They're living out their faith in Christ day by day in this kind of cultural milieu. My friends, biblical Christianity knows of no other God who is like what Paul says here in verse 17, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. You see, today you and I are challenged by people, by the culture, by people in the culture, even those that we love, even our families, that would say that there's no difference between the God of other religions and the God of the Bible. But friends, we must say, unequivocally, along with King David, for example, who said, There is none like you, O Lord, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And you find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 20. And we must say unequivocally with the prophet Jeremiah, who said, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Jeremiah 10.10. Well, Francis brings us to what Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. We find this right here in verse 17, the last half of 17, 17b. Paul prayed that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, uh, I want to talk about a conundrum that you might find here if you notice it. But I, I want to talk about it because it's important and it's in regard to the word 
in this particular text here, verse 17, spirit. Now I'm using the ESV, the English Standard Version. It translates this word along with the other translations, the word spirit with the S capitalized. But in some other translations, the original word is translated with a lowercase letter, S. For example, the King James Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the New American Standard Bible. Now, is this something that we should be concerned with? Uh, big picture-wise, absolutely not. This is not a place to divide over, but there is a point to be made. However we take this word, capitalized or not, the wisdom a believer, you and me, and a body of Christ, a church, should pursue, should come from God, not other places. But I would argue that when we look at the context of chapter 1, we know, for example, that a believer has been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's verse 14. Who not only guarantees the believer's inheritance to come, we also know by the, by the New Testament that the Holy Spirit also knows the mind of God. And Paul would say it in this way in Romans chapter 8, 27. Paul said, and he who searched hearts knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit. So it's reasonable, and maybe even beyond reasonable, uh, even correctly, in edu uh, uh, correctly to interpret by the, by the context of chapter 1 in the New Testament, to understand that Paul is praying that the all-wise all Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, would reveal to the believers in Ephesus the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. And what is meant, the question is, what is meant by the word revelation here in our text? Well, it means this, the communication of the knowledge of God, who God is, what he does, and all that, that knowledge to a person. I just want to press pause for a second here and ask you this question. Has, there, has anyone ever asked you, do you hear from God or how do you hear from God? Has anyone ever said to you, God told me blank, 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 blank. Or maybe you have said, God told me blank, 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 blank. Now, I'm not saying what I'm about to say to condemn anyone. But I would ask your, your grace to hear me through. Yes, the Bible teaches that we can have a personal, personal relationship with God through Christ. A close and intimate relationship with God. A believer has a relationship with God through Christ. But does it mean that we should be able to sense God speaking to us through some sort of inner voice, inside voice? And when you consider maybe even the last 10, 15, 20 years, if you check it, you'll find it. There's been some really crazy, wacky doodle things that people have said by saying, God told me, blank, 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 and often quite outright heretical and harmful to many. There was this one such time in 2008, uh, approximately a half million people uh, went to the so-called revival in Lakeland, Florida, you may have heard of it. And there they went to hear televangelist Todd Bentley preach. And it was, one of, during, and it was during one of these meetings that Bentley, Bentley explained this. And now I'm going to quote him. Quote, and there is this old lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. In other words, God spoke to him. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. Kick her in the face, he says. End quote. One more example. Then there was prosperity preacher Leroy Thompson, who said at one of his meetings, quote, God said, it's time to tell money, you don't belong to the wicked, you belong to us. Money, come to me now. End quote. And, you know, I think we could go on and on and find all sorts of examples of heretical, unbiblical uh, teaching that God supposedly had said to someone or another. Now, these are examples of the extremes that can be found, but it happens in more quiet ways, if I can say it that way, 
in Christianity, in the evangelical church today, that God speaks to his people in this inner voice. But more importantly, we need to ask, how are we to understand what Paul meant when he prayed that God would give the church at Ephesus the wisdom and revelation to know more God or the more knowledge of God? And specifically, how would God do this? How would God do this? And how does God do this today? Well, the answer is right here in front of us in the text. It is by the Holy Spirit, whose ministry, a part of his ministry to the believer is to reveal the knowledge of God as he illuminates their minds and their hearts as they read or hear the word of God. That's how God did it in the past, and that's how God does it today. Well, friends, with this in mind, Paul here goes on and elaborates on the knowledge that he's praying about that God will reveal to the Ephesian believers. First, he's praying concerning the hope of God's calling. The hope of God's calling. We see this in the middle of verse 18. That you may know what is the hope of which he has called you. And this word called or calling used here is in the sense of an invitation. In this case, God inviting people to accept the benefits of salvation through Christ. We see Paul's comments in his first letter to the Corinthian church helps us understand this. There Paul said, because of him, that is God, you are in Christ Jesus, who is to us the wisdom from God, which is what? Righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Uh, so I don't want to get into the meaning of all those words, but you find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 30. <coughs> so it is in the knowing, the comprehension of the finished work of Christ on the cross that a believer finds hope for today and for the future. So there's the hope of God's calling, and next we have the treasure, if you will, of God's inheritance in the saints. It's right here at the end of verse 18, 18c. So what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So the question is, what is the inheritance in the saints? Well, we could go on and on about this, but here's look at, let's look at a few of these things. Well, first, the believer's inheritance is inexhaustible because it's from God. It's inexhaustible. Whereas Paul put it in a different way here in verse 7 of chapter 1, he lavished this upon us. What did, God, what did God lavish on the believer? Well, we've already said in the last week or the first week that we started this series, he lavished on us the forgiveness of sin and deliverance from the guilt of sin. Deliverance, uh, the forgiveness of sin and deliverance from the guilt of sin. That's called redemption. But there's more. The word inheritance here points to a future time yet to come even for you and me today. When the believer or his heir, as Paul put it in the letters to Galatians, will fully realize their glorious inheritance as sons and daughters of God. That is a day to come when Jesus returns. So we have the hope of God's calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and thirdly, the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, or the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, verse 19. And the question then is, how is this great power of God revealed and proclaimed? How is it revealed and proclaimed? Well, one, by our personal experiences as a believer when we place our faith in the finished work of Christ. Two, God has already demonstrated his power or his great might in history when he, in Christ, raised him from the dead. He raised Christ from the dead, verse 20. And third, God has seated Christ, his son, at his right hand in the heavenly places, verse 20. So what we have here is a picture of Christ, or as Paul writes <coughs> pardon me, in his letter to Colossae, Paul said, by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
all things were created through him and for him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. My, my friends, this speaks of the preeminence of Jesus Christ. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus Christ is preeminent. That is, he is before, he is above, he surpasses all things. Someone put it this way, quote, the preeminence of Christ means that we submit fully to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, which he already rightfully inhabits. Jesus Christ is Lord of Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Now, do, you really, do we really understand what this means when we are faced with the things that we see in our culture and even our day-to-day -day struggles, maybe? In all of life, do we understand what this means? And are we uh, submitted fully to the sovereignty of Christ? Friends, God has made Jesus Christ Lord over all the natural realm and the spiritual realm, the powers and the spiritual powers, everything that exists, everything. And even over your life and even over my life, everything, I mean everything has, as Paul uh, said, been put under his feet, verse 22, put under his feet. And when it comes to the church, God has placed Jesus as head over all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, verse 22 and 23. And it is Christ, the head of the church, that you and I, according to chapter 4, verse 4 and 6, where Paul said, we're called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You know, when I, I think about this prayer that Paul is praying here with thanksgiving in his heart for the Ephesian believers, for the Ephesian church, when I consider the experiences I've had with prayer in the corporate body of Christ, it seems to me that a large portion of our time in praying when we join corporately is in the asking God for either some physical healing or for God to intervene uh, in a conflict or a natural disaster. And here in our text, Paul is praying for a greater revelation, a greater knowledge of God in Christ for the church of Ephesus, a greater understanding of the awesomeness and the power of Jesus Christ compared to everything else, a greater understanding of the holiness of God, which would lead to a greater understanding of our sinful lives a greater understanding of exactly what God has accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. A greater understanding of our place and purpose in the church and in the culture in which we live. But I do ask, please do not hear me say that we shouldn't pray for healing, for peace in the world, for wildfires to end. But I fear more often than not, my friends, that we realize, uh, more, more often than we realize that we treat God maybe without even knowing it as some magic genie in a bottle. Rub three times and get your wishes. Maybe, just maybe, we can pray from time to time like the Apostle Paul prayed for others and for himself. To know God more and more. To grow in his grace. To simply praise him for he is worthy of all praise. Pastor J.R. Packer was a Canadian-born theologian and pastor, and I want to close with one of his quotes on wisdom. Quote, The fruit of wisdom is Christ-likeness, peace, humility, and love. And the root of faith in Christ is the manifested wisdom of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we just thank you for your word. And as we consider here um, this tone in this letter the tone of praise to you Lord for all that you have done all you had done for the Ephesian believers through Christ and, and this attitude of prayer combined together Lord they are amazing they are, they are wonderful gifts you have given to us and I pray that we would not only praise you but that it would also lead us to pray to you and when we pray that it would lead us to praise you 
And Lord, that we would be wise in our decisions every day, that we would ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us through these things that we are dealing with today in our own lives and in the, in the culture around us. And we show thankful, Lord, that one day, one day when it's all said and done, when Jesus returns and sets things right, we will receive our complete inheritance, which you have given to us through Christ to be sons and daughters of the living, holy, and just God. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, thanks again for having me in your places. God bless. Shalom.